Father, guide us step by step. Step by step. Day by day. Bless this day, this gathering. As we have gathered unto you, Lord, today. Bless today. Let your presence be manifest here. Let your power be manifest here. Deepen our persuasions and our faith in you. Deepen our love for you and the saints. Open our eyes, cause us to see and to know the essence of our faith. Father, grant grace and unction to speak as an oracle. And let your name be glorified in our lives. Lord, help everybody and let us today, let us be one step closer to our purpose for you. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you thanks. Father, we bless your name. In Jesus' name we have prayed. Hallelujah. Praise God. All right, it's good to see you all. Hallelujah. Following God's plan for your life. Hallelujah. And um, like I said, I should just say again, the objective and the essence of this series is to try and, um, you know, try and show us from God's word what God's purpose and God's plan for our life is and how we will be able to walk in it and how we'll be able to, you know, enter the, that plan that God has for our lives. And the first thing I'm trying to, I try to do, you know, trying to do the first three Sundays of this series is to try and give you a big picture, a global view of what the purpose of God for humanity is. You know, try to give you a global view of what God's purpose for mankind is. Because if you have a wrong view of what God's larger plan for humanity is, when you're trying to find your own purpose inside of it, you will be on the wrong path. Hallelujah. You'll be on the wrong direction, right? If you enter the wrong door, if you enter the wrong door with respect to the understanding of the purpose of God, it won't matter how you conduct yourself. Once you've entered that door, you'll be wrong already. Do you understand that? Do you get what I just said now? Once you are going in the wrong direction, it doesn't matter what you do in that wrong direction, you are still wrong. Do you understand that? So, you have to have a right and proper understanding of the big picture, the global view of what the purpose of God is for humanity, and there's no place better than to see it in God's word. So, that's what I'm trying to do. And one of the major issues that tends to confuse people and tends to put people in the wrong direction with respect to this global view is the tension. It's not even a tension. I, let me show you that one. I've taught people bad, bad a bit now. Is the, is the issue of how... Where should you put your mind? What should be your priority with respect to God's plan for you? With respect to heaven and on earth? This is a, is a legacy tension and it is, the truth is that most of in history, historically, you know, orthodoxly, and that means historically, traditionally, for Christianity, there's not really been a difficulty. But I think as the ages progressed and we got into the Enlightenment and then the Industrial Revolution and all these times when human beings became very prosperous and health became easier and all that, you know. And then with the with the with the with the addition of World War Two, World War One and World War Two, that caused a lot of calamity and catastrophe for humanity. The sense of the amount of focus that people began to have on this physical earth began to increase, and so by extension, it also began to affect um, the Christian view of these things, and so. It, it, has, it has become a serious question of what does it mean to be heavenly conscious? What does it mean to be heavenly conscious? And that's why you hear a lot of um, statements like, you know, especially in the posts, post, um, I don't want to mention names and mention tags, but, you know, the motivational resurgence, motivational, Christian motivational resurgence that grew, that, that came up in the 90s and the early 2000s. I don't know how many of you guys are familiar with that move, but you know, growing up, we're very familiar with that movie. Especially if you come from a Nigerian, you know, Pentecostal um, setting, right? Um, you begin to see a lot of statements like, um, don't be heavenly conscious and earthly relevant. How many people have heard that before? How many people have heard that before? You've never heard that before. You just, you just got saved. Though. <laughs> don't be heavenly conscious and earthly relevant. Um, 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 you know, those kinds of statements. And so it caused the kind of tension right? Then the idea that how much you have on the earth is a proof of how much the grace of God is in your life. 
right? How much you have on the earth is a proof of the amount of the power of God that is at work in your life. So the more power, the more stuff you have, you know? And so what happens is that by, through the back door, people became, people's gaze actually became on the earth and not on heaven because it's a trick. It's a trick. If you say, if you tell people, your gaze is meant to be on heaven, you say, yes, we agree. You now say, but earth will determine how heaven will be. So where will you put your gaze? Earth. Do you understand that? But the funny thing is that you can't have your gaze on both of them at the same time. It's not possible. Like, you know, the Papa will say, and God says, can you look up and look down at the same time? Say, no. Therefore, don't say you're looking at me while you're looking at me. Hallelujah. That's some powerful stuff. Amen? I'm not joking. I'm serious. It's actually powerful. You can't claim to be looking at heaven and be looking at earth at the same time. You cannot say, I'm heavenly conscious, but I want to be earthly conscious. It's not possible. Thank you. You cannot say I want to be earthly, heavenly conscious and be earthly relevant. It's not possible. That's the simple truth. But when you say it, especially when you come from a background, you throw people into a lot of initial confusion. Then questions like, are you saying, begin to come up. Are you saying that? Are you saying that? Those kind of questions begin to come up. Are you now saying that what we are doing on earth does not matter? Are you now, do you understand that, right? So that's why it's important for you to know. Now, another thing that is very important for you to keep in mind is that, see, if you want to be earthly relevant, eh, you will pierce yourself with many sorrows. Those are part of the things I want you to understand. There's a critical mass of people that are, you know, um, okay, so there are different kinds of atheists, right? There are different kinds of atheists and agnostics. That it is that we're just born into atheism. My parents did not really go to church. They didn't care. So me too, I don't really care. I don't think about it. Those kinds of people, when you see them, you will notice that they are not angry. They're just there. Say, so, yeah, you Christians are ah, nice, nice one, nice one. Yeah, they go to church, eh, nice one, nice one. More they go club, more go, more go shy, you, more go, you understand that kind of thing, right? They're not angry. They're just having a good time. Then there are those that you see on Twitter that are angry, that if you just say God is in control, which kind of useless God is in control? Those ones, they usually come from Christian homes. Go and check. They usually come from Christian homes. Whenever you see anger, anger comes from offense. Anger is an emotional reaction to offense. There is no anger without cause. Anger is a reaction. Do you understand that? Normal, have you ever seen somebody that even someone that is just early in the morning is just angry? Have you ever seen somebody like that before? Even if you see somebody like that, go and check what he dreamt about. Or check the kind of person that he's married to. Or check the kind of place of work he's going to that is making him. Do you understand that? Anger is a reaction. If you see an atheist that is angry with Christianity, he's angry with you Christians. He's coming, he's angry. He or she is angry. There are more guys, but by experience we know. Right? Uh-huh. That's why Jesus had more female followers, all right? Uh-huh. So maybe in heaven we'll have more women than men. I'm just joking. Uh-huh. Right? That was a joke. Cool. Yeah. <laughs> Praise God. And why are these guys angry? Why are these guys angry? It's offense. Somebody has done something at one point in time. Someone has said something at one point in time to the person that got the person very mad. That got the person very angry. Hmm. Praise God. And there is nothing that has contributed to it, as far as I can tell. So let me speak as based on my own experience. As far as I can tell, recently, in our own Nigerian context, than disappointment. Dashed hopes. Disappointment and dashed hopes. You promise people that you're meant to be earthly relevant, that this world is an evidence of how much grace of God you have. Therefore, if you want it badly enough, If you believe God for it well enough, God will give it to you. And then God doesn't give it. Then there are also the brand of people that lived with someone that claimed that they were Christians, but were behaving like unbelievers at home and betrayed them and broke their hearts. Either their parents or loved ones or a former lover or something. Praise God. I talking to someone. I will not look at his direction earlier this week. I'm sorry that even relationship can make people to Lose faith in God. You break your heart, and because of that, God, no, that they no, no. 
<laughs> Praise God. Anger. But guess what? Now, all the things that makes people to be betrayed, all the people that conduct themselves like that, that betray people, you know, usually come from a place of a preaching of a gospel that is not the gospel. Traditionally, Christianity should be such that people that can hide and fake Christianity should not be many. People that can hide and fake Christianity, they should not be many. I'm not saying it is impossible. That's why I'm trying to be you know, very careful with the way I'm saying it. But people that can fake Christianity, it shouldn't be, it shouldn't be easy to fake Christianity for long. You shouldn't be a deacon in church and be an unbeliever. Traditionally, it's not meant to be so. Don't think of the when the Roman Catholics were the only ones running Europe. I'm not, that, that, it was the entire thing was they were all unbelievers. That's different. I'm talking about traditionally where you have Christianity. You cannot be a pastor, the elder of a church, and you'll be an unbeliever. It's, or you'll be someone that is betraying people at home. It's not supposed to be. Because the gospel is such that it's supposed to be something that is so clear and is supposed to affect our conduct so clearly that as many as named as are called by the name of the Lord, we know them because they depart from iniquity. Do you understand that? Shouldn't be. This idea that churches having a mixed multitude is the status quo shouldn't be. That having a mixed multitude of people a mixed multitude of people that the church is popular because they know that the boys in that boys in that church they are bad boys or the girls in that church they are bad girls. This, that's the status quo. They just know that there are these particular types of churches that once you see them, you know there are many bad boys in that church. When boys are looking for girls, that's the normal thing. It's actually not supposed to be. And what creates that system of that kind of church? I guarantee you in this church, eh? Unless something happens to me and the Lord calls me to believe me. In this church, if you start believing like a non-believer. You will stand out and you'll be kicked out. That's just a simple truth. You will stand out and you'll be kicked out. There's no place. And one of the things or the major thing that causes it is when we have something that is not really the gospel being the operating system of that church or that organization. When you have something that is not really the gospel being the operating system of that organization, if a group of people, doesn't matter how many they are, thousands of them, gather around a kind of idea or a kind of philosophy, for example, that um, the essence of faith is to have plenty of stuff. The more stuff you have, the more things that God does for you. And then your programs are oriented around that. You have prayer meetings that are oriented around getting people's stuff. And then you have testimony time that is oriented around that kind of stuff. So people who have stuff come and give testimony of the stuff they have. And so those that don't have stuff feel like as if God is not working in their lives and then they want to have stuff. Then those that have stuff, even when they are living like unbelievers, still believe that they have God's endorsement because stuff is the proof that God is with you. So you can have stuff, be believing like, behaving like an unbeliever, but you, God is still with you. And so that's why you can come to church boldly. That's why you do pray and you, you say God has forgiven us already. And so that thing begins to build a culture that leads to that thing you see. And it's that culture that also builds to the point where people will be popular in church. Pastor knows them. They are endorsed. They are sitting in front, but they are unbelievers at home. And they hurt people and betray people at home. Those people now become angry and become atheists. Then they come to Twitter to be dragging us. Do you understand? Do you see the way that whole thing happened? That's what happens. And where does everything start from? A bad a replacement of gold with brass. A lie that is being called the gospel. That's where everything starts from. A lie that is being told the gospel. Sometimes the lie is so subtle and so simple. That's why Paul calls it craftiness. That's why Peter calls it cleverly devised fables. It's actually very seductive and very smart that the undiscerning that's why sometimes those conversations are very difficult to have on social media. Where you're telling someone that you're supposed to be an exile in this world, just like the apostles tell us. But the person is saying no, they're meant to take over the thing and then begins to give Joseph, Esther, and Daniel example, of which I'm going to look at it today. We'll see what's really to learn from Joseph, Daniel. We'll see. 
It's like I say, it's difficult to have those kind of conversations because we are talking about craftiness of every wave of doctrine. We are talking about cleverly devised fables. It's actually difficult. Like like Luke was testing and prophesying in Luke chapter twenty-eight. He said, "In the last days, prophet and um, faithful prophets will rise, that even the elect may be deceived." So it's actually very seductive. It's very difficult that you actually have to sit down and examine because, like, one minute past twelve, you think you are together. The way they start. But if you are undiscerning, they've led you into the bush and you won't know. Church, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm saying all these things to really help you understand the reason why I'm taking my time with this series like this and why this series is important. You need to first have an accurate big view, global view. You need to have an accurate big picture of what the purpose of God for humanity is so that you don't enter the wrong way from the beginning. So that you don't enter the wrong way from the beginning. You need to understand it properly. Hallelujah. So if this is your first time of joining this series, I implore you listen to the first two because a lot of things have been said already. Okay? But I'll just remind you of some things. First Peter chapter 1. Now you guys know that I'm very, very, it's very, very important that we are traditional in Christianity. And by traditional, I mean apostolic. We follow what the apostles left, not what men cooked. So that's why we're sola scriptura. We believe very much in God's word. We are Bible-centered, and the Bible is what the Lord gave us through his holy prophets and the apostles. Now listen to what the apostles say. This is Apostle Peter saying this. Since you call on a father, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. My apologies, 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 17. Since you call on a father... Who judges each person's work impartially? Live out your time as foreigners here in reverent what? Fear. This is Christianity. You call on God who judges everybody impartially. Listen to me. Live out your time as foreigners here. Your time on the earth. No matter how long it is. You are supposed to leave it as a what? Guys, I hear what I'm saying to you. Leave it out as a what? Oh. Just scroll, um, go to chapter 2. If you're using a paper Bible, you flip to the next page. If you're using an iPhone, iPad, just scroll down. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. First Peter chapter 2, verse 11. Dear friends... I urge you as what? Foreigners and what? Exiles. American Standard Version says as sojourners and what? Pilgrims. Have you seen someone that went to Jerusalem and sat down there? Wouldn't they come back home to come and tell us what they experienced there? As foreigners and what? Exiles. To abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. You are a foreigner in this world. You are an exile in this world. You are a sojourner. You are a pilgrim. You are a stranger. You are an outsider. Don't let anybody deceive you with a crafty message that this world is yours to take over. Taking over this world is for those who are of this world. The world you will take over is coming. Are you me now? <laughs> hey, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Let me give credit to some of people who I know that are not sexually, but let me just try and be charitable. And I'll just say that there are some people who say these things and preach these things passionately that probably believe that what they are preaching is true. But sincerity does not make a lie to become true. Hmm. Philippians 3, verse 20. Philippians 3, verse 20. But our citizenship is where? And we eagerly await a savior from the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you see the posture? We are here like people waiting for something to happen. We are here, not as people tabernacling and settling down and not looking forward to something to come. 
if we did not have anything to look forward to, if we, don't have, if we don't have anything to look forward to, then we are doomed with, together with this world because this world will pass away. We are waiting. Our body posture is that something is coming. This place does not have all the answers. That's why you are living your life. You will get to certain points like as if things just don't make sense. Things will not just make sense because we are pilgrims. We are citizens of heaven. Our real country is the new Jerusalem. That's where we are citizens of. Hebrews chapter 11. The writer of Hebrews explains what men of faith do. This is how men of faith behave themselves. Hebrews chapter 11, talking about the heroes of faith. Look at what he said. He said, all these people, talking about people of faith, all these people were still living by faith when they died. This is what real faith is. All these people were still living by faith when they died. They did not receive the things promised and only saw and welcomed them from a distance, admitting that they were what? Foreigners and what? Strangers on earth. A faith that tells you that this world is not for waiting for something to come, but is for faith, is for conquering this world and making it your home is a lie. It's a lie. Faith is not to help you to conquer this world and take it over. Faith is to hold you until you get to your own country. Did you hear what I just said now? Faith is not to help you to conquer this world and take it over. Faith is to help you until you arrive at your real home. To keep you and preserve you until you alive, arrive at your real home. We did something on the book of Hebrews some weeks ago. You guys remember, have you? Yeah. Yeah. Faith is not about... That's why if you scroll down to the end, you will see how they talked about all these people of faith. Verse 32 says, And what more shall I say? Do I not have them talk about Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, David, and Samuel, and all the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, see you, administered justice, gained what was promised, who shut the mouth of lions, quenched the fury of the flames, and escaped the edge of the sword, whose weakness turned to strength, and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. Women received back their dead, raised to life. There were others who were what? Tortured, refusing to be what? Released, so that they might gain an even better what? Resurrection. Some faced jails and what? Flogging. And even chains and imprisonment. They were put to death by what? Stoning. They were sawed in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in what? Sheepskin. Do you want to be a man of faith? He tell you that faith can help you get a jet. Let me tell you what people that in faith, this is what happens to them sometimes. Sometimes you'll find them going about in what? Sheepskins and goatskins. Destitute and what? Persecuted. And what? Mistreated. The world was not worthy of them. When you read the first part, you talk about conquering armies and conquering kingdoms. We'll look at it now. you see what it means. Because you now say, hey, some people conquer the um, Mount, um, nations. I'm the ones that conquer mountains. You people that are destitute, <laughs> destitute. Don't worry. You will see. You will see how one person was conquering nations and destitute at the same time. And you will see what conquering nations actually means. You think it's to be CEO of MTN? Wait, you will see. You think it's to be CBN governor? Wait, you will see. Church, all together. Jeremiah 29. So Jeremiah, um, t- um, the apostles, Peter, Paul, um, the writer of Hebrews tells us that um, you know, the, we are exiles and we're strangers, we're pilgrims, we're sojourners, we're outsiders. And this is what it looks like when the prophet Jeremiah tries to show us prophetically through what happened to the children of Israel, you know, speaking to them but for our benefit so that we can learn and understand what it means to be an exile and a sojourner in a place. Verse 4, this is what the Lord God Almighty, the God of Israel, says to 
all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. So those of you that are in Babylon, or in exile in Babylon, this world is our Babylon. This world is a type. Of, no, Babylon was a type of this world. Look at what it says. It says, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number, dear, do not decrease. Hallelujah. It says, also seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will what? Prosper. Yes, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. Do not let the prophets and diviners among you deceive you. Do not listen to the dreams you encourage them to have. They are prophesying lies to you in my name. I have not sent them, declares the Lord. Therefore, and this is where some people have gone wrong in the past. If someone comes and tells you that while you are in Babylon, you are not meant to do anything, the person is prophesying lies. See what I just said now? If anybody comes and tells you that this world, you are not meant to do anything, just be looking for what Jesus has come to call, is, is to deny the sovereignty of God. Is to deny the, um, the, the present mindedness and intentionality of God. Is to make God a functional deist kind of God. A God that is not involved in affairs. A God that is far and distant. To deny that God has plans for us in this world, material things that we can do, is to be prophesying lies. Indeed, the Lord wants you to build houses and what? Settle down. The Lord wants you to plant vineyards and do business. The Lord wants you to get married. Those that the Lord wants to get married. The Lord wants you to have children and multiply. The Lord wants you to give your children out in marriage. And the Lord wants you to be participating in the peace of Babylon. That means things that make for good civilization building, build in it. Build. Be part of it. Pray for it. So that if it prospers, you too will prosper. So God wants us to be involved in the peace of our nation. God wants us to be involved in the governance that will make this country to be good or Babylon, whatever country that you have. And as many of you that God legitimately sends you to another country, go to that nation also and be involved in the peace of it. It's not everybody, but those of you that God sent. I will not stop to remind you of that. Because it is not possible that God's will is for everybody that can afford it to leave the country. It is not. It is not. Cannot be. Any kind of life that is dependent on Nigeria's economy, not on the will of God, cannot be the will of God, obviously. If you are moving just because of Nigeria's economy, then it's not God that is leading you. Who is leading you? It's Nigeria. It's not possible. Any movement that will change just because Nigeria's economy changed, then it's not God that is leading you, obviously. You are just doing what all the animals in this world do. Elephants do it. During dry, dry season, they move from where it's dry to the... You don't know. Have you known National Geographic? All the animals in the world do it. You are just doing it on a higher level. On a sophisticated level. When the one part of the, of the, Safa, the, Saha, the, the Serengeti is dry, the elephants will migrate to where there's rain. And when rainy season comes, they will move back. Is that not what people are doing? The same thing with deer and the water buffaloes. Migration, yearly migration. When Hamatan is coming and they smell it in the air, they know this place is about to be dry. Then they begin to migrate to where will be what? Green. And then the lions that are eating them also follow them in the migration. Birds do it. Even fish, trout. When it is time to mate every season, they will start heading towards the sea where they will mate. And that's where there's also plenty of green for their children to, for the eggs that is. You guys don't watch National Geographic. <laughs> ah, that's why you guys be watching these things. These things manifest the glory of God. Fish, all of them, all the animals do it. Sharks, um, the, the, what they call it, um, titles in the, in the sea, they do it. Do we move during the, when the, the, sea, the cold winds are coming in one part of the ocean, they will start migrating to where there is warm heat because that's where algae, um, algae and phytons and all those things are where they can eat is. And then sharks will follow them. And then whales will follow them. And dolphins will follow them. And when that place finishes, they will migrate. But that's what we're doing. There's dry season in Nigeria, let us go like buffaloes to Canada. And then the lions will also follow them. But you are more than that. You understand what I'm saying? 
You are not just a buffalo that has two legs and can press from. You are not, you are not a bird that doesn't have wings but can, can walk with his hands. You are more than that. Obviously. Those animals are under the elements of the world. We are the only of God's creation that God gave the ability to make a place something. Those ones follow what the world makes or what the climate makes. We have the ability to shape a climate. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? We are led by God's purpose and plan for us. Not just our physiological needs. Not just our bellies. So what are we together? So, as many as you know should go and go, and every other person, whether, whether you are here or whatever choice you make and all that, while we are in Babylon, the Lord says you should build houses and do all these things that we talked about it last Sunday. And I said, see, this is a big error that we must never fall into. This world is not our own. This world is not meant to be perfect. Does not mean that this world is meant to be hell. The only place that should be hell is the place that God is absent from. The place that is away from God's presence. Because God is the good. God is the great. God is beauty. Anything that is cut off from his presence will be hell. So that's what hell should be. But God is on the earth. God is with us. So even though this world is not perfect, and he did it on purpose, and we'll look at it now, even though this world is not perfect, it should not be hell either. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Do you hear what I just said? Now? Even though this world is not meant to be hell, it's not hell, it shouldn't be. It does not mean that this world, this world, um, this world is not meant to be hell. Therefore, but the fact that I say this world is not meant to be perfect does not mean that we're not saying that this world should be hell. So anybody that comes and tells you that you should live in this world as if this place is hell, just suffer, 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 suffer without any good, without seeing any beauty, without seeing any goodness, without seeing any pleasure of God in your life, without having any good. Just suffer and go to heaven. The person is prophesying lies. Because someone that even prophesies that is actually jeopardizing the new Jerusalem also. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Someone who says that you should not do anything in Babylon is also jeopardizing the new Jerusalem. Do you know why? Just, let me just continue. Do you know why? Because our conduct, how we behave ourselves, how we do, how we handle the things that we have been given, how we take care of the things that we have been given is a demonstration of our new Jerusalem mindedness. Someone who is focused on heaven, someone whose heart is focused on heaven, when the Lord commits things to his hands, he will handle those things as someone who knows he's going to give account to God. You will see now. You understand now. So if someone says the thing that God has given you, throw it away. Don't do anything with it. The person is telling you lies. That's why you cannot come to this church and now say, I'm heavenly minded. I, I, I'm a guy. I'm heavenly minded. I'm not going to do anything. I'm not looking for work. I'm heavenly minded. You are going to hell. It shows you are not heavenly minded. <laughs> you say, what are you doing in your life? What are you doing? You say, I'm not doing anything. I'm just, I'm just chilling. I'm just trusting God. Say, you say, we're heavenly minded. We're focused on heaven. You're not focused on heaven. A lazy person. Hallelujah. Church, I was together. Let's look at um, Revelation 21. No, sorry, let me, let's finish this. Verse 10. Now it says, this is what the Lord says. When 70 years are completed for Babylon, 17 years here is a type for the short time we will spend on the earth. No matter how old you get, air gets, even if you live in the most healthy, prosperous nations in the world where people don't want to die, and you know there are certain countries in this world, no jokes, their life expectancy is 90. Did you know that? There are some people that are just being born in that country. You are likely to live to 90. Yeah. Even if you are born in that kind of country, you will still die. You will still die. It's not you can do about it. And then the real life will now start. <laughs> so 70 years is a type for the short period of time that we have here in Babylon. It says, when 70 years are completed for Babylon, I will come to you and fulfill my good promise to bring you back to this place. For I, I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, 
plans to give you a hope and a future. In the first part of the series, we looked at what a hope and a future is. A hope and a future is not a time when you become a billionaire. I know the thoughts I have towards you, thoughts of good and thoughts of evil. So give me a future and a hope. My future, I'll be great. I'll have plenty of cars. Uh, no. A future and a hope for the Christian that Jeremiah is speaking ahead of. Your hope is the hope of your salvation, the hope of your calling. Your future is your eternal life with him. So, and this is good. And you will not be, and this is one part. Ah, I can preach a whole message on this. You see what he actually says here. And if you look at it with the eyes of, you know, the eyes of the fact that Jeremiah is speaking ahead of something. He says, for I know the plans I have to you, for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. When we leave this world, we will not be disappointed by what we we'll see. This is one assurance that you can have. It didn't just struck me this morning. When I was praying for seven, my wife was wondering what happened to this guy early in the morning. I just found myself singing before the throne of God. This thing just struck me. That, you know that feeling of, what if it's a lie? What if it's not true? What if, when we die, we'll be surprised with what we see? Jeremiah is speaking ahead of something. He says, like, the plans I have for you are not plans that will harm you. As many as call upon the name of the Lord, he will never put them to shame. I'm telling you, when we leave this world, what you will see on the other side in the presence of God will not harm you. You will not be disappointed. That's why no man can bid me death depart. No man can bid me death depart. He, the plan that he has for us, after this Babylon and all the good and bad times that we have in Babylon, what he has for us that is coming will not harm us. Hallelujah. Praise Jesus. He says, then you will call on me and come and pray to me. I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me. When you seek me with all your heart, I will be found by you, declares the Lord. I will bring you back from captivity. One day we will go back. I will gather you from all the nations and places where I have banished you, declares the Lord. And I will bring you back to the place from which I carried you into exile. He's going to bring us back to that place, that paradise that he took, that he put Adam in eventually, and then God banished him from his presence. That's actually what he did. That word banished, ah, that word banished is exactly what he did in Genesis chapter 3. Let's go and read it. Just as Adam sinned, all of us sinned in him, and all of us became sinners. In the same way, he banished him from that land. And just that's what Jeremiah is speaking to here. And Peter also explains to us that as exiles, we are banished from that Jerusalem and we are going to return to that new earth. He now says, after God had given everybody water, water. He now says, verse 23, Genesis chapter 23. So the Lord God did what? Genesis chapter 23, eh, chapter 3, verse 23. So the Lord God what? Banish him. Hallelujah. The Lord God did what? Banish him from the garden of Eden. That land where he banished us from, we are going to return. So that land is not going to harm us. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a good and beautiful land that he has for our future. Plan that he has for our future. Praise God. <laughs> you mean So he banished us. He banished us and put us in Babylon. Let me tell you what that means. Romans chapter 8. I want you to understand very well. I want you to understand very well so that you can you, you will know and nobody can bamboozle you. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Romans chapter 8, verse 18. Are we together? Romans is after Deuteronomy. <laughs> Romans chapter 8, verse 18. He now says, I consider. That our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. For the creation waits in eager expectation for the children of God to be revealed. I grew up hearing that the whole of Nigeria is waiting for me to blow. That when I blow, Nigeria will stop suffering. That's what I grew up hearing. That, you know, at my secondary school, it's called secondary school where we were, I don't want to mention names of denominations. Where we were taught, you know, we were taught fate. And the fate was that, see, hammer. If you don't have, some people's destinies are tied on you. <laughs> if you don't blow, some people will not blow. 
If you, are, if you don't hammer, some people will not hammer. Do you know how many destinies are tied to you? <laughs> so for the creation, all of your creation, me, I'm the child of God. <laughs> but creation means what? Creation does not mean other human beings that will hammer or no hammer. Creation means what? Creation means everything that God created. He says for, in verse 20, for the creation was subjected to frustration not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in what? Who? Do you see that? By the will of the one who subjected it in what? So it was God that subjected the whole of creation to what we are experiencing now. When he banished us from that land and put us in a place that was compatible with our evil nature. I've talked about this things many times. It was his will. That is the, you will see now. It was his will. It is his will, rather. It is his will that this world is not perfect. It was subjected to frustration on purpose. Because evil people cannot be in a perfect world. That world will still become evil. Evil people cannot be in a perfect world. The nature of the people in that world must match their environment. You cannot put, you cannot give them robbers eternal life. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? You cannot give pedophiles eternal life. We were driving back yesterday. I was listening to one of my favorite podcasts. They were listening to it with me. People don't realize something. Let me give you a little segue. <laughs> you don't know that it was Christianity that changed this world. Before now, the normal thing for human beings, and I mean the normal thing, I mean the normal thing, all the great empires you can think of, start listing now. From where you go far east to the Chinese plains or the indo iranian invasion of Indias, or you come to the Middle East and the Persians, the Babylonians, the Medes, and you come to close Middle East, um, the Ottomans, the Turks, you come to Western Europe, you come to North Africa, and everywhere you can think of empires. There's some things that they all had in common, and all of them were doing universally. One was slavery, normal level. The second one was that men, you know, you see, <laughs> You know what? You know, it, you, because you have grown up in a world that's been affected, that's affected by Christianity. When people are talking about alphabet people, you see, alphabet people, eh, oh, don't do that, don't do that. It's wrong, it's not the will of God. Listen to me. Before now, before Christianity affected everybody's behavior, it was normal. If you grew up in the room that Paul grew up, it was normal, it was on the road. Let me tell you what they used to do. Powerful men. Number one, all you women that have equality of rights now, they are coming to work with us. There's nothing like that. You first put you people in harem, 4,000. We'll talk about Esther now. I will explain well, you understand. Put like 4,000 of you, and the person will be sleeping with you one per day. It doesn't change women in his lifetime. The one he changes is the one he likes. Then, but those women, they are complicated because number one, they can give birth to children. And when they give birth to boys, the boys will start feeling like they can take over his power. So they usually try to manage it. Like, let me give you an example of the Ottomans. If you give birth to many sons, they'll say only one should survive. All the brothers should kill themselves. And they'll kill their mothers with them. And all their mother's family. This was normal. This time I'm not saying it's just one. Normal. The Romans, everybody was doing it. Let me tell you the one that will bust your head. And that normal thing they were doing was the, the term called beardless boys. All the Romans did this. The Ottomans did it. Egyptian kings did it. Everybody did it. They will capture little boys and castrate them from when they are small, so that they will never grow beards and never have man voice, and they will be sleeping with them. They also use them as eunuchs to be heading their, their, their head of women. Normal. You understand what I said? Say normal. Normal. It wasn't strange. You who have grown up in the world, nobody teaches you, please go and read history. This is normal. Normal. There's a Roman king, there's a Roman emperor. You know what he did? He had a boy that he was doing like that. He had wife, oh, but he had a boy that was using like that. That one now died when he went to Egypt for a holiday. He now made the boy a god, and people started worshipping him. He shocked you. <laughs> Normal. Those are the people you now want to give eternal life. That they should never die, they should never fall sick. Listen now. Those are the people you want to put in a world with unlimited resources. 
that if they need anything, they will just get it. God says, it's not me and you. I love you too much. I will not let you destroy yourself. Leave the Garden of Eden. Go and stay in a place that matches your depravity. When time comes, my children will be taken because they will not be perfect and they will have my spirit. When time comes, I will remove them from this world and put them in a perfect place that matches their nature. So that is why because we have the reborn spirit and we are regenerate, we can stay with God eternally. Do you understand what I'm saying now? That is the reason why many people don't realize, say, how can God create hell? Listen to me. For the man that rejects God, heaven will be like hell to him. You don't understand? For the man that rejects God, the man that does not want to be in God's presence, Shabit, this guy said it. What's one of these 80s philosopher? The one in New York, University of New York. The guy said it, that if heaven really exists, I don't want to go. Because I don't want to be in the presence of God that will be scrutinizing me and be telling me that I don't want, that you must not do evil, must not do bad. I want to live my life the way I like. If, 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 boys are, if the boys are in hell, allow me, that's where I want to go. Do you understand what I said? So creation was subjected to frustration on purpose. Verse 21 now says, in hope, verse, the end of verse 20 says, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decree and brought into the freedom and the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we who. So it is not strange that we are going through pain and suffering. It is not strange. The faith that makes you feel like as if Christians are not meant to suffer. Suffering is strange. If you are suffering, it's because you have missed something in your faith. Your faith is not strong enough because Jesus died so that you will not suffer. It's a lie. It's a lie. Even we ourselves are doing what? Hey, come on, you guys are looking at me. Where's verse am I again? Verse 23. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruit of the Spirit, do what? Grown inwardly as we await eagerly for our adoption to sonship, the redemption of what? So we are waiting for heaven. That is, that is what I was telling you last week. You guys thought I was, sound, I was sounding, I was moving weird. As I was telling you. We are waiting for our adoption, the, the redemption of our bodies. The redemption of our bodies is the final solution, is the real solution to all the suffering in this world. When I was saying yesterday, last Sunday, we were laughing, I thought it was weird. The solution to sickness is what? Yes. It's being with the Lord. It's redemption to sonship. It's death. The solution to people breaking your heart is what? Yes. It sounds funny, but you can see where I'm feeling it from. That's why we are groaning. That's why we are suffering. The solution is our new, new Jerusalem. So don't let anybody carry you away with any kind of philosophy and saying that this world is perfect, this world is your world, nothing will happen. If you believe God, your life can be perfect. It's a lie. In this world, you will find tribulation, but be of good cheer because I have done what? Welcome to the world. Revelation 21. This is what your new home looks like. This is where we are going to. Then verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had what? Passed away. And there was no longer any sea. When he says, I will return you to the land from where I banished you. This is where he's taking us back to verse 2. I saw the holy city. The new what? Jerusalem. Coming down out of heaven from God. Prepared as a bride. Beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look! God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more what? Death. Or what? Mourning. Or what? Crying. Or what? For the old order of things have what? Hallelujah. Glory to Jesus. That's some good stuff. My future for you, my plan for you is not one that will harm you. My plan for you is not one that will harm you. It's a good one. It's a good one. Hallelujah. We're not going to die like chickens and dogs. No. It is my feel like they want to die and just, no, we're not going to die like that. Our lives actually have meaning because we are going to a better place. Hallelujah. 
So while we are here, we must conduct ourselves properly in Babylon. How do you know how to, because I want to make it practical, because when people ask me questions during the week, I want to make it practical and easy for you to understand. So since we know what our focus is, and we know what this world is, and we know that we are exiles in this world, how exactly should we conduct ourselves? How do I know the point that I've gone too far, that I'm no more behaving like an exile, I'm not behaving like a Babylonian? How much houses should I build? How many vineyards should I plant? How many women should I marry? One. How many children? <laughs> How many children should I have? As many as your wife agrees to. Do you understand? How much in politics should I involve I am? How much politics and advocacy and activism should I do? This is, I'm going to give you the global picture, then from next Sunday, we'll now start zooming into the particulars of how you conduct yourself as an individual. Second Timothy. Sister Ephraim gave me this one as a good way, a good scripture to explain it well. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy chapter 2. Second Timothy verse chapter 2, verse 3. This is how Christians sound. You no, know, nowadays, um, Apostle does not want to die again. Apostle does not want to go to heaven. We should sing another verse. Apostle no one suffer. Apostle no one suffer nowadays. Apostle just wants to be born. I want to live like that. That's why you see someone on the pulpit will be preaching. You say, all of you want to suffer. Me, I don't want to suffer. Me, I've come to enjoy myself in this world. Anybody that wants to suffer, you're going to suffer. You're not saved. I'm not saved. I think Goku mentioned anybody's name. <laughs> How can you say that? <sighs> Do you know what we're talking about? Do you know what? <laughs> Verse 3. Join with me in what? Join with me in what? Like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding Officer, this is a good scripture that will help me to articulate it, to help you to know when you have started going too far, how much to involve yourself in Babylonian affairs that you have begun to jeopardize your new Jerusalem. He says you don't get entangled. How do you know you're not getting entangled? He says, but rather you try to please your commanding officer. Who is your commanding officer? God. That's right. Your commanding officer is God. Thank you because for being saved. Your commanding officer is God and this is how you know when you are beginning to entangle yourself in Babylonian affairs. This is how you begin to know when you are begun to take over and you are now a Babylonian and you are going to hell. The first thing obviously is not even to be planning to take over. I think we have settled that one. Because once someone just starts saying I want to take over, I already know that this one has entangled himself already. You have entangled yourself. Now, you are trying to please your commanding officer. That means that in your building of houses, in your planting of vineyards, in your marrying and having children and involving yourself in governance, you are trying to please your commanding officer. That means anytime you are doing any of those things and your commanding officer is not pleased with it, you know that you have become a Babylonian. It's that easy. It is that simple. Very simple and very straightforward. Very easy and very straightforward. So, I've said this thing in other ways before. This is just a way, a, a polite way of saying it. It's always a green light only till it's a what? Red. So, if you see a house that you want to build, you have a green light. Just like the word of God says, build houses. That means do what has to do with physiological needs. You understand what I'm saying? <clears throat> Check, last, listen to last week's Sunday's message. You don't understand. Build houses. I know that, what that means. It's a green light. Build houses if you see a house that you want to build. But it becomes red. You stop. At the point where your building of it has become an offense to your commanding officer. At least from God's word, we know what our commanding officer is. That's why following the plan, we'll talk about this more next Sunday. Following the plan of God for your life, primarily, the number one thing to be led. If you get this, you have gotten being led, you will be, you will be overled. Overled will worry you. Is to know God's word and be filled with it. I can tell you one thing that your commanding officer wants. Your commanding officer says, do not despise the gathering of the saints. If your work and building houses and governance is making you to, become, to begin to despise the saints, you're a Babylonian. Yes. 
Amen? Amen. If you're angry, you don't open. That's why we don't close the door during service. <laughs> Did you hear that now? This is how you know. The kind of work that will make you to not be seeing you in church again. You are no more active in church. You have started to entangle yourself. You have become a Babylonian. The kind of marriage and relationship that will make us not to see you in church again. Don't say I'm using church because I'm a pastor and that's what people pastors usually want. That's the word that came to my mind. So just take it as the Holy Spirit is speaking to somebody, all right? Because I have plenty of other examples. Any marriage that will make you to not please your commanding officer has started making you become a Babylonian. It's that simple. How much do I know whether I should set my eyes on things above or things below and all that? Setting your eyes on things above, that means you do everything as long as it does not remove your gaze from things above. So that means the things above are the things that will determine your conduct. It's not the things on the earth that will determine your conduct towards heaven. So it's not your work that will determine how much you have time for God. It's your having time for God that will determine the kind of work that you will do. This is the reason why Christians cannot really take over. It cannot. The person that tells you that you must take over is going to make you an apostate. Because the things that you need to do to take over are things that is only Babylonians that can do it. How many vineyards should I build? How, that's why I said, I wanted to ask, I asked you that many women should I marry. Is one, because anybody that makes you marry two has already made you. Babylonians have two wives, two are more wives. Christians have only what? Once you have two, you're already what? Babylonian, hallelujah. I'm joking. I'm not talking about those that were married to two people before they got saved. I'm talking about those that were saved and now want to go and marry two wives. You are not saved. Or two husbands. Let me, not, let me, let me balance it. <laughs> are you hearing what I'm saying to you? <clears throat> you? Every of your conduct is towards pleasing your commanding officer. Anything that begins to rob you of the fruit of the Spirit in doing it Anything that you are doing on the earth that is not compatible with the fruit of the Spirit, any kind of work that robs you of the things of the Spirit, that is contrary to God's word, that is contrary to what is pleasing to God, as manifestly expressed in the Bible, is wrong and is Babylonian. So that's how you know when to stop. This is, there is no balance there. It is simple. This is it. Be new Jerusalem conscious and occupy Babylon. This is the answer to it. Do the things that you should do. Involve yourselves in Babylon, but don't get entangled in it. The point that you begin to involve yourself in Babylon to the point that you begin to ignore, forget, or disobey your commanding officer is the point where you have started going too far. Church, are we together? It's very simple. That is the answer. Pastor Sam, how do we balance it? That's the balance. Even though I don't like to use that word. It's that simple. This is the reason why I know for a fact that not all of us can have the same amount of material resources. It is not possible. Because if this is our standard, that wherever we are, we are doing only as much, we are only following God's plan for our life and doing what is pleasing to the Lord as we occupy Babylon, I guarantee you we cannot all have the same amount. Some people will be born in a place where you know, the way God has put them, without breaking any rules, they will be able to do some things. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? Yeah. And there are some people that if you are born in a place, that for you to break out of that place and climb the socioeconomic ladder, so to speak, you have to go to the child of Satan. Do you understand what I'm saying to you? This is the balance. It's easy. This is the balance. That's why, let me just quickly end with this. The three culprits that they usually use to try to tell people that the destiny of a Christian, if they are working properly, is to attain the pinnacle of Babylonian positions is Joseph, Esther, uh, Joseph, Joseph Daniel, and Esther. Now, those three people are, example, are the three examples in the Bible that they usually hold up as examples in the Bible of how Christians should attain, to struggle to attain onto material positions and wealth as proof of how that God was with them. How many people don't, if, I'm sure we should all know the story of those three people, right? So I don't need to go too much into details. I'll end here. Now listen to me. This is one thing that all those, that's why you will see that those three people are actually, they are really examples, but they're not examples the way those people think. Number one, 
One thing you will notice is that none of these three people planned or schemed for the position that they have. Joseph did not know he was going to be prime minister. He was in the prison. Daniel did not know. He was generally in Jerusalem and they came to pack them. And they made them eunuchs. Esther was just living on her own, a part of people that did not go back after the exile with her uncle. And the, the king was angry with his wife. And now said they should go and round up many girls. He was not sleeping with them one after the other. One per day. And once he sleeps with one, he will never go back to that one. And that one, no man can sleep with the person again. Can you imagine that kind of life? Don't take over. None of them planned for the position. So, Daniel cannot be your example that I want to attain a certain material position. Your goal as a believer is not to attain to a certain material position. Your goal is to do the will of God. I've tried to explain this thing to you. If you believe that the Lord wants you to participate in the governance to, make, to help and contribute to Babylon's peace, what you will be saying is, I want to contribute to Nigeria's peace. Not that I must be president of Nigeria. I must be president of Nigeria. I'm confessing for the last 20 years. I must be governor of my state. It is, I want to contribute to Nigeria's peace. That is the reason why, if all you are doing is advocacy, or somehow you find yourself local government chairman, they vote you there, or they, you will not say that the person that is president is doing more than me. Do you understand that? Because what is your purpose to do, not to have? Did you hear what I just said now? Me, I know that the Holy Spirit will help you to understand. Your purpose is to do, not to have. You cannot say my purpose is to have the position of being president. Your position is to help Nigeria. So that means that if it is in your neighborhood, you are the head of me, you are the organizer of the people in the neighborhood to keep it clean, you are doing the purpose of God. And so that's why you will not say because somebody was once president, you should come and be an elder in the church. Church, are together? Number two thing that is very clear for all the three of them was that all of them were outsiders. None of them were the kings. All of them were slaves of the king. I hope you know. <laughs> Listen to me. There's something you don't understand about ancient times. I people don't understand when they read all these things. Being a slave, I need to end now. The fact that they give you the, the fact that they give you gold clothes does not mean you are not a slave. In ancient times. A slave can have gold clothes. Another one can have dirty clothes. All of them are what? Slaves. So that is the reason why the butler and the other one that was making food for the pharaoh, they were slaves and they were dressing well. And Joseph saw a dream and interpreted the dream. For they had a dream and Jesus interpreted it. And both of them were walking in the palace and they just beheaded one's head. Just remove one's head. A slave is a slave. No matter how well he dresses. People don't realize this. Joseph was a slave of Pharaoh, even though he made him prime minister. If any of Pharaoh's family members have come and tell him, Joseph did something wrong. You know what will happen to Joseph? It's his head. You will see on the city gate. You want to take over? Is that the kind of takeover you want? Many times people are using Joseph as an example. They don't actually understand what happened there. And they have this fantasy, this anachronistic view of what Joseph must have been going through. He must have thought that Joseph was like, now at this democratic situation, where you are the prime minister, it means you are free. You think that when you are prime minister, it means that you are free. When they say you are prime minister of the Pharaoh, it means you are the top slave. That's why when something happened, and the king woke up and he could not remember his dream, he said they should go and bring the dream for him. He said, you can someone remind you of your own dream? He said, go and kill all of them, including Daniel. Do you want to take over like that? That you, are, you think you are a big man, but they can kill you because your God did not remember his dream. That you go to a country and they will castrate you. You say you know that Daniel was most likely an Enoch. You don't know. You don't know. Oh, that's what happened. When they packed all of them and brought them, you cannot come and be sleeping with our daughters and our women in the palace. In the palace, they castrate everybody and they'll be teaching you stuff. Hey, can you read your Bible now? You don't know. They say, supposed to be like Daniel. Go and be like Daniel. You say, I want to be like Esther, the number one concubine. See the Yale, the one that came just before her. That one, they said, come and dance for us and the men. Come and dance for the men. Imagine that kind of dehumanizing thing. Come and dance for us, the men. They say, no, I'm above that. He wore, cut off her head, bring me another one. I want to be like Esther. Go. Number three thing that all of them did in common was that all of them were focused on behaving themselves properly in pleasing God. 
That was their plan. Their plan was not about, I want to be the number one wife. I want to be the prime minister. Their own was, let me just do the will of God where I am. And then the Lord now put them in that platform. Their focus was on being well pleasing to God, not attaining material positions. That should be your plan also. That is the lesson that those three people can give you. Number four lesson that you should learn from them is that none of them changed Babylon. And this is one thing that you must keep in your mind and you must always remember. Just like we've said over and over, I don't want to go about. None of them changed Babylon. Immediately Joseph died within a few years. The next, a few pharaohs later, they forgot who Joseph was. Even while Joseph was there, they remained pagans. Did Daniel convert the Medes and the Persians to, 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 to Judaism? Did it come, when did they when did now change to um, Babylon? Um, they first, the, um, what do you call it? The Babylonians and then the Medes and Persians took them over. When were Babylonians before they became Medes and Persians? Did they change them from their paganism? Did Esther change um, the Persian Empire to, to, to Judaism? Did they not remain Babylonians? So this idea that you want to make this world perfect, all you can do is do what God's will is for you. And that's why I should say this at this point. If you want to make this world better, the most important thing you can do, the greatest contribution that you can do is to preach the gospel. Because every nation is the, every nation is the fruit of the average beliefs of its people. If you have many people in a nation being good people, that nation will be what? Good. If you want Nigeria to be better, preach the gospel. A woman who is a nurse or is not a big woman that is an assistant to somebody that gets him saved and bring him to the knowledge of Christ so that he begins to behave himself properly is doing more for this country than a man that claims that he's a, he's a clinical, he's a, he's a pastor, he's a man of God clinical and goes there and cannot do anything. Because you cannot. Many people forget that the immediate vice president of this nation was a pastor. You think you love God more than him? You think you know God more than him? Finally, listen. And most importantly, for people who are saved, Joseph, Daniel, and Esther were types and shadows of what Jesus was going to come and do. Joseph was a type of a man that would go into captivity and for all intents and purposes die so that his people can be saved. That's what Jesus did for us. Do you hear what I just said now? Daniel was a type and shadow of the man that was an intercessor praying for the people of God to be delivered because the word of God had said something concerning those people and he prayed as an intercessor to bring about the fulfillment of that word. Just like Jesus is our high priest and interceding for us forever. Esther is a type of what Jesus came to do. When she said, if I perish, I perish. She said, if anybody goes into his presence without his consent, the person has died. And Esther went ahead. As um, Esther went ahead. And for, in a way, she actually died and rose again. Because anybody that goes like that will die. In a sense, she actually died and rose again. Why? So that her people can be what? Delivered. Hallelujah. That's the most important thing. Joseph, Daniel, and Esther are types and shadows of how one man can go through great suffering and come out on the other side so that his people can be saved. Joseph and Daniel and Esther are not the examples for materialism. They are not your examples for power hungriness. Your purpose is to do the will of God, not attain certain statuses. The status will be the fruit of what God is doing in your life. Church, all together. Let's bow down our heads and pray. We'll continue next week. I'll put your hand on your chest. I want to pray with you. Put your hand on your chest. Pray with you. for you in the name of Jesus. We pray together as a church. And I pray for you. I pray for you in the name of Jesus. That in this world you will not forget the voice of your Lord. You will not forget the voice of your commanding officer. You will not forget the voice of your Lord. As you, as you go into your, into your affairs, your mundane things, as you build houses and plant vineyards, and marry and have children and are involved in governance, I pray for you in the name of Jesus that you will not, inv- you will not forget the voice of the Lord. 
you will not forget the voice of your God. You will not forget the voice of your God. As the Lord prospers the work of your hands, as your things prosper, as you do more with what God has given you, as the Lord apportions talents to you, and you use it and you multiply it, I pray for you. When your master comes, you will not be ashamed. You will not forget the voice of your master. You will prosper in this world. And you will be with the Lord at the end. In the name of Jesus. You will prosper in this world. And yet you will not forget, forget the Lord your God. You will prosper in this world. Yet you will not forget the Lord or your God. Through you many will come to the knowledge of Christ. Through you many will be saved. Through you many will know God. And your things will prosper. In the name of Jesus. Father, we give you thanks. Father, we give you thanks.